<laughs> yeah, this thing is dope. Sunday gun day. I'm gonna use that as the intro. <laughs> What's going on everyone? Back with another episode of Stuff and Things and today we're taking a look at a special build that I just put together in collaboration with Panda Tactical. Now I know some people don't like when I go crazy all out with builds so for this one I decided to keep it a little bit modest. This is essentially my idea of a mid-budget build not being super over the top but still giving you great functionality, reliability, and of course aesthetics. So let's not waste any time and just jump right into it. This has been dubbed the V1 TS Panda build thanks to the awesome new branded lowers coming from Panda Tactical. We have my logo on the left side and of course Panda's on the right. The Seekins Precision Safety Selector will let you choose if you want no pews or pews. The more pews the better in my opinion. Also in and on the lower you will find a Strike Industries mag release and takedown pins, a mag pull trigger guard, as well as a K2 grip since this is a pistol after all. The real icing on the cake is all of the Geisley goodness from the bolt catch to the Super 42 buffer spring combo and of course the Super Dynamic combat trigger. And yes, even those parts have TS logos on them. The brace is a CMMG rip brace and I will definitely cover that here in a second. Now moving to the top, everything is in a new Frontier upper to match the lower. From the back forward, we have a Geisley supercharging handle, yup, that has a logo on it too. A Strike Industries forward assist, dust cover, and hand stop on the rail. Speaking of the rail, this is an SLR 11 inch ion ultralight, which hides the SLR fixed gas block, tube, and comp, which is fixed on a Roscoe 10 and a half inch barrel to match the bolt carrier group. And finally, to top it all off, we have some MBUS flip-up sights and a Nikon P-TAC spur on a UTG mount. Woo, that is a lot of info all at once. If you guys have any questions on any of the parts that went into this build, I will leave a parts list in the description down below, so go check that out. Now, other than all of the overly complicated part names on here, this thing is pretty straightforward. So I'm not gonna waste any time, let's just get straight into the first mag impression. All right guys, first mag through the TS Panda build. I already dropped it in the snow, so we're off to a great start. So far I have the Nikon P-TAC Spur just sitting on this UTG mount, co-witnessed with the MBUS flip-up sights. I'm not sure if they're on, so I'm back here at about 30 yards. We'll see how it does. Let's make sure I don't break my lens this time. Fireballs. All that snow is melting off of there. I miss shooting ARs. <laughs> oh, this mag is sticky. All right, guys, back for my first mag impression of this new build. Like you saw there, I did actually drop this thing in the snow. So once I was running those first couple of mags there, there was a ton of steam and smoke coming off of the barrel. I typically don't like to torture test rifles and stuff like that, and not that that was super hard on it, but this thing held up fine, obviously. Now there are a lot of parts on here that you have seen me incorporate into other builds in the past, so basically I'm going to kind of breeze over a bunch of those, but I guess I will start with the ergonomics and something new that I have not used before, and that is this brace back here. So this is actually a new offering coming from CMMG, and this is what they call their RIP brace. Yes, this is a collaboration with SB Tactical, and it does look very similar to their SBA-3. However, there is some new technology in here that is not in the regular SBA-3. Keep in mind, this is a pistol brace. It does have the Velcro on the back here that you could put your arm through there if you wanted to. This is a 10 and a half inch barrel. And like the SBA-3, it has a little adjuster here. You can press that and put it in whatever position you want it in. But where this differs is actually their proprietary buffer tube. So because this is called the rip brace, in order to deploy this brace, you literally rip it and it stops. 
On the underside of the buffer tube here, you will see that there are little holes with threads in them, and that is because this thing has a stop pin. This is a fairly short buffer tube since it is a pistol configuration, so I personally like running it all the way out. However, if you wanted to change that length of pull, you could put a set screw in here. That way, when this thing is all the way collapsed, when you go to pull it out, it will stop wherever you put that screw in. Now, other than that, it does have a QD mount here, and then on the back here, there are two more points of attachment if you wanna run a sling. And I do actually really like this brace. It is a nice feature because for the most part, I'm always running my stock or brace, in this case, at the same exact spot. So the ripstop like this basically eliminates guesswork. If you want to get to this thing and get to it quickly, boom, you are ready to rock. Now they do also include a buffer and spring in here, but I of course opted to switch that out for the Geisley Super 42. It's really hard to explain the difference between a stock buffer tube and spring versus that Geisley one. I have explained it in some videos in the past and I like it so much that I basically put it in all of my pistols and rifles now. We have lost Sunday Gunday for some reason. But anyway, if you guys want to find out more information on this kit or that Geisley buffer and spring, of course, check it out for yourself. There's a lot of good information out there on the internet. Now moving forward for the rest of the ergonomics, Magpul K2 grip, I put those on basically all of my ARs and pistols, especially pistols. It changes that grip angle just a little bit and I definitely prefer it over a standard like A2 style grip. I really do love a lot of the stuff that Strike Industries puts out like the dust cover and the mag button. These curve hand stops, I put these on basically all of my builds nowadays. I probably bought like five or six of them in one shot. Even the takedown pins, they really pay attention to the detail in all of the small parts. They are super easy to install for a bunch of different designs. They really take some of the minor conveniences that go into building an AR and just make it a lot easier with designing their parts a little bit differently than everyone else. So all of that stuff is really awesome for the safety selector. I have pew and no pew like you guys saw on the lower. This is a 45 degree selector from Seekins Precision. They make really nice stuff as well. Not quite as nice as the Radiant Talent selectors. Those are my favorite safety selectors and I put those on some of my more expensive builds. But this thing looks and functions great and I actually use one very similar to this on my TS Panda 300 Blackout build. Now as far as the upper and lower receiver go, they do have very nice finishes on them and this is the forged one as well. I will grab the billet a little bit later and show you guys a side-by-side -side comparison, but as you can see here, this does have a really nice slick finish on it. A lot of the cheaper lower end receiver sets seem to come a little bit like chalky and it feels like they can get scratched up really easily. I'll also bring another lower in here in a second and show you what I mean about that. But yeah, I'm actually very impressed with this. This is the V1, like I said. We may do some revisions to my logo specifically. I would like to see this get a little bit thicker if this is something that we are going to continue to make in the future. But as of right now, there are only a handful of these and we will see what future versions we will release. While we're looking in close here on the side, this is a maritime bolt catch from Geisley. Yes, they did put my logo on that and on the hammer as well internally, which no one's gonna see unless I'm showing you on video, but that is still a cool touch. This thing is definitely a lot bigger, so you can get your thumb on there and actuate it or release the bolt very easily. Geisley makes some really high quality stuff and they are actually building out their full pistols and rifles. I think they may be available sometime around the spring, but I'm not quite sure yet. There is a very good chance that you guys will see a full Geisley build on the channel here in the future. And here you can see the Roscoe Bolt Carrier Group. I don't have enough experience with this yet to let you guys know what I really think about it. But so far the combination of that Bolt Carrier Group, the Roscoe Barrel, and then the SLR gas system, everything seems to be functioning very reliably. If you took note of the injection pattern there, everything looked perfect. I don't need to adjust anything. And yeah, so far I'm pretty happy with that. One thing that I'm not super stoked on is the finish difference between the SLR rail and then the upper and lower. That is really me nitpicking and my OCD kicking in. When I build things, I want them to be like as perfect as possible for whatever my vision is. And for the most part, that is why a lot of my builds end up being expensive, but I didn't want to get too nitpicky with this one, so I left it how it is. I could Cerakote the entire thing if I wanted to, but as of right now, you can't really tell, and I think it's starting to grow on me just a little bit. As far as functionality goes, of course, I got the strike curve on here. I love these things. I put them on all of my pistols and rifles. 
The rail is M-Lock and it does feel pretty thin in my hand. Definitely a very good feeling rail. And then coupled with that SLR muzzle device on there, this thing fits perfectly with the rail. Now, as you guys saw there, I was kind of surprised with the fireball and concussion on this thing. Of course, a shorter barrel is going to do that, but this muzzle brake is actually pretty impressive. Once we get into shooting this thing a little bit more, you will see how it directs those gases out directly in front of me. I had no problems with gases all day, whether it was coming back at me or around my hand area. Yes, it did get a little bit warm as I shot a lot of rounds through it, but it seemed to be pretty good. And then on top, the MBUS flip up sights. These things are relatively cheap. I went with the plastic ones instead of the pros. I could have went even cheaper on there, but like I said, I wanted to keep this sort of a mid-level build. I just sat those things on the top rail, put my Nikon PTAC spur on the UTG mount, and then co-witnessed it. This is very similar to the sight setup that I have on the Atom Smasher. The only thing that is different is that I'm using the pro sights on the more expensive one. So I really didn't have to do a whole lot of adjustment. Everything seemed to line up good, and then I even took it out to some further distances, and it shot great. So again, that was a lot of information all at once, but I know you guys are here to see the shooting of this thing, so let's go back to the range footage and put some more rounds down range. All right, I'm gonna step a little bit back further than normal to start, that way you guys can get a full appreciation for the concussion and fireball that's coming out of this thing. We're back here at about 50 yards to test out some accuracy. I apologize to all the hardos in the comments section who are always like, oh, shoot at paper, ringing steel doesn't mean anything. That's fine, I get it, but both the left and right targets, they do ring a little bit differently than the middle two, and you'll be able to tell the difference. The ones on the outside are about five and a half inches across, so that gives you a little bit of a accuracy demo. Again, I don't know if this thing is going to be on because I just co-witnessed it with the sights that I plopped on top, but we'll see how it does. Big ones are on. How about the little guys? Slow lap. Little low lap, right? There we go. That could be just me, but I'm not gonna change the sights until I actually sit down at a bench. This thing is so violent, it's awesome. bringing out some more fun stuff to go with the fun gun. KCI USA, baby. <laughs> 100 rounds. Let's see if it can run with this thing. Now we're taking a relatively lightweight AR and making it much heavier. But it's heavy with ammo, so that's a good thing. He's taking cover behind the car. <laughs> this thing is so ridiculous. Yeah, this thing is dope.
Well, 556 is not the cheapest round in the world. So this is courtesy of all the patrons who support the channel over on Patreon. Thanks to you guys, and this mag dump is brought to you by them. That is warm. It is just cooking that coating on this muzzle brake. Damn. All right guys, back for some final thoughts on this version one of a TS Panda build. One thing that I will hit on quick is this trigger. It is exactly the same as the one in the Atom Smasher, so I've already given my thoughts on it, but here we will do it again. I, for one, love Geisley products, including their triggers, especially these flat face triggers that they make. If you have your finger up here, you will need to apply a little bit more pressure, but down here you can get a little bit more leverage and it makes it a little bit lighter of a pull. This is a two-stage trigger, so if I pull this thing back, I will get right to that wall. Super defined, I know exactly where it is every time. And then it might be a three and a half pound pull. Super crisp and clean break. It's almost like glass breaking when you do. Reset is nice and short, super tactile and audible. You know right where it is resetting. A little bit of take up back to that wall because it did kind of push my finger off of it there. Another super crisp and clean break. So I of course have been using a lot of Geisley triggers in my builds over the past couple of months now. And I've actually started to test out different ones as well, so I will bring you some more content regarding these triggers in the future. Now as you saw there, I did get the chance to run around in the snow a little bit. We had some fun. It was a fun day out on the range for sure. The site did need a little bit of adjustment there. It was not off all that much. For run and gun type of combat zero, if you want to call it that, this thing is working fine as of right now. This is a 3 MOA dot on the PTAC spur, so I could sit down at a bench and get this thing zeroed very accurately, but for now, it works. Now, as you saw towards the end there, when I was cooking off 100 rounds relatively fast, if I zoom in here on this muzzle device, you can see that the coating on there did take a little bit of a hit, but I guess that is to be expected. I'm obviously not shooting full auto with this thing, but I was shooting fairly quickly, and I guess it caused this to kind of carbon up and bubble a little bit. This thing still did a great job of taking all of those gases and the concussion and putting it out away from me. Like I said, it does seem pretty violent, but when you're shooting it and you are actually the one behind the gun, it was very manageable. The thing shot relatively flat, and although it is shooting big fireballs and you can sort of see, feel, and hear that concussion, it's really not too bad when you are the one behind the trigger. Now I did bring in some of the other options here when I was referring to the lowers earlier. So first I will compare this coating of the TS Panda lower to this Aero Precision lower. And this is not knocking Aero in any way. I think they make great products. Now it may be kind of hard to tell on video here, but you can see that the coating on the Panda lower is a little bit more slick than that of the Aero. You can actually probably hear it when I run my fingers over them. This one is a lot louder because it is more like chalky feeling. If you guys ever handled different types of lowers before, you will kind of know and feel the difference and then you'll be able to pick which one works for you. I much prefer a slicker coating like the one on here. It is not going to scratch quite as easily and these are made by NFA. They make a lot of different lowers for a bunch of different manufacturers, so chances are you may have had your hands on something very similar to this before. Now both of those were forged. Let me compare this one to the billet version. Here you have a very similar finish but as you can see this one is all billet so there is some really nice machining all around the front of it on the side here over by where all of the controls are there is a little bit of a step down machining there this one still reads pew and no pew and then there are very tiny details that go into these lowers that are also very nice. For example here, the threading and a pin for the bolt catch that goes right through there. Also on the back, I've never actually put together a lower that has this before, but there's actually a little Allen set screw in there that you put in there after you get your pins installed. If you've ever put a lower together, you will know how much of a pain those things can be. You end up crushing the spring and then you have to get another one. Sometimes the spring will go shooting out across the room, so that is really a nice touch. 
Also, there is a threaded insert in the back here so you can adjust the play between an upper and a lower when you do mate this with an upper. And overall, this is a super clean looking lower. I really am a fan of it. But the reason that I wanted to build out the forge is just because it is a little more cost effective. Right now, you can pick these up on Panatactical's site, the forge, for about $65 plus shipping. Or if you want to go the nicer, more expensive billet route, these are going to run about $120 plus shipping. So it is very cool that Panatactical offered to do this and have a collaboration with me. I'm definitely a big fan of this gun. Granted, I do like some more expensive things from time to time, but I figured you guys would want to see what you can do with a lower like this while still having a relatively cost-effective build, but being super functional and aesthetically pleasing at the same time. So I know I went over a lot of this very quickly, so if you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments down below. Also, reach out to Panda Tactical on their Instagram or their website. All of those guys are very knowledgeable about all of this stuff. So if you have any very detailed technical questions, those would be a good group of people to ask. Also, thank you to Geisley for putting my logo on all of these parts. I actually don't know if I showed a close-up of this supercharging handle back here. This thing is Ambi, has a very nice coating on here, and it of course meets those Geisley standards. This thing is definitely awesome. I really don't have anything else to say, but I do really want to go back out there and keep shooting. Only if this snow would stop anytime soon. Why can't it be like that here? It looks way warmer and there's no snow, so hopefully that will come here soon. Alright, if you are new to this channel, consider clicking subscribe. I make new videos every week and that is going to be all for today. So as always, thank you guys for watching and I will talk to you in the next one.